Chapter 3, What Worry May Do to You Businessmen Who Do Not Know How to Fight Worry Die Young Dr. Alexis Carell Some time ago, a neighbor rang my doorbell one evening and urged me and my family to be vaccinated against smallpox. He was only one of thousands of volunteers who were ringing doorbells all over New York City. Frightened people stood in lines for hours at a time to be vaccinated. Vaccination stations were opened not only in all hospitals, but also in firehouses, police precincts, and in large industrial plants. More than 2,000 doctors and nurses worked feverishly day and night, vaccinating crowds. The cause of all this excitement? Eight people in New York City had smallpox and two had died. Two deaths out of a population of almost 8 million. Now, I have lived in New York for over 37 years, and no one has ever yet rung my doorbell to warn me against the emotional sickness of worry and illness that, during the last 37 years, has caused 10,000 times more damage than smallpox. No doorbell ringer has ever warned me that one person out of 10 now living in these United States will have a nervous breakdown induced in the vast majority of cases by worry and emotional conflicts. So I am writing this chapter to ring your doorbell and warn you. The great Nobel Prize winner in medicine, Dr. Alexis Carell, said, businessmen who do not know how to fight worry die young. And so do housewives and horse doctors and bricklayers. A few years ago, I spent my vacation motoring through Texas and New Mexico with Dr. O. F. Gober one of the medical executives of the Santa Fe Railway. His exact title was Chief Physician of the Gulf Colorado and Santa Fe Hospital Association. We got to talking about the effects of worry, and he said, 70% of all patients who come to physicians could cure themselves if they only got rid of their fears and worries. Don't think for a moment that I mean that their ills are imaginary, he said. Their ills are as real as a throbbing toothache and sometimes a hundred times more serious. I refer to such illnesses as nervous indigestion, some stomach ulcers, heart disturbances insomnia, some headaches, and some types of paralysis. These illnesses are real. I know what I am talking about, said Dr. Gober, for I myself suffered from a stomach ulcer for 12 years. Fear causes worry. Worry makes you tense and nervous and affects the nerves of your stomach and actually changes the gastric juices of your stomach from normal to abnormal and often leads to stomach ulcers. Dr. Joseph F. Montague, author of the book Nervous Stomach Trouble, says much the same thing. He says, you do not get stomach ulcers from what you eat. You get ulcers from what is eating you. Dr. W.C. Alvarez, of the Mayo Clinic, said ulcers frequently flare up or subside. According to the hills and valleys of emotional stress. That statement was backed up by a study of 15,000 patients treated for stomach disorders at the Mayo Clinic. Four out of five had no physical basis whatever for their stomach illnesses. Fear, worry, hate, supreme selfishness, and the inability to adjust themselves to the world of reality these were largely the causes of their stomach illnesses and stomach ulcers. Stomach ulcers can kill you. According to Life Magazine, they now stand 10th in our list of fatal diseases. I recently had some correspondence with Dr. Harold C. Haybane of the Mayo Clinic. He read a paper at the annual meeting of the American Association of Industrial Physicians and Surgeons, saying that he had made a study of 176 business executives whose average age was 44.3 years. He reported that slightly more than a third of these executives suffered from one of three ailments peculiar to high-tension living heart disease, digestive tract ulcers, and high blood pressure. Think of it a third of our 
business executives are wrecking their bodies with heart disease, ulcers, and high blood pressure before they even reach 45. What price success? And they aren't even buying success. Can any man possibly be a success who is paying for business? Advancement with stomach ulcers and heart trouble? What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his health? Even if he owned the whole world, he could sleep in only one bed at a time and eat only three meals a day. Even a ditch digger can do that and probably sleep more soundly and enjoy his food more than a high-powered executive. Frankly, I would rather be a sharecropper down in Alabama with a banjo on my knee than wreck my health at 45 by trying to run a railroad or a cigarette company. And speaking of cigarettes the best known cigarette manufacturer in the world recently dropped dead from heart failure while trying to take a little recreation in the Canadian woods. He amassed millions and fell dead at 61. He probably traded years of his life for what is called business success. In my estimation, this cigarette executive with all his millions was not half as successful as my father a Missouri farmer who died at 89 without a dollar. The famous Mayo brothers declared that more than half of our hospital beds are occupied by people with nervous troubles. Yet, when the nerves of these people are studied under a high-powered microscope in a post-mortem examination, their nerves in most cases are apparently as healthy as the nerves of Jack Dempsey. Their nervous troubles are caused not by a physical deterioration of the nerves, but by emotions of futility, frustration, anxiety, worry, fear, defeat, despair. Plato said that the greatest mistake physicians make is that they attempt to cure the body without attempting to cure the mind, yet the mind and body are one and should not be treated separately. It took medical science 2300 years to recognize this great truth. We are just now beginning to develop a new kind of medicine called psychosomatic medicine a medicine that treats both the mind and the body. It is high time we were doing that, for medical science has largely wiped out the terrible diseases caused by physical germs diseases such as smallpox, cholera, yellow fever, and scores of other scourges that swept untold millions into untimely graves. But medical science has been unable to cope with the mental and physical wrecks caused, not by germs, but by emotions of worry, fear, hate, frustration, and despair. Casualties caused by these emotional diseases are mounting and spreading with catastrophic rapidity. Doctors figure that one American in every 20 now alive will spend a part of his life in an institution for the mentally ill. One out of every six of our young men called up by the draft in the Second World War was rejected as mentally diseased or defective. What causes insanity? No one knows all the answers. But it is highly probable that in many cases fear and worry are contributing factors. The anxious and harassed individual who is unable to cope with the harsh world of reality breaks off all contact with his environment and retreats into a private dream world of his own making, and this solves his worry problems. As I write I have on my desk a book by Dr. Edward Podolsky entitled Stop Worrying and Get Well. Here are some of the chapter titles in that book. What Worry Does to the Heart High blood pressure is fed by worry. Rheumatism can be caused by worry. Worry less for your stomach's sake. How worry can cause a cold. Worry and the thyroid. The worrying diabetic. Another illuminating book about worry is Lion Against Himself, by Dr. Carl Menninger. One of the Mayo Brothers of Psychiatry. Dr. Menninger's book is a startling revelation of what you do to yourself when you permit destructive emotions to dominate your life. If you want to stop working against yourself, get this book. Read it. Give it to your friends. It costs $4 and is one of the best investments you can make in this life.
worry can make even the most stolid person ill. General Grant discovered that during the closing days of the Civil War. The story goes like this, Grant had been besieging Richmond for nine months. General Lee's troops, ragged and hungry, were beaten. Entire regiments were deserting at a time. Others were holding prayer meetings in their tents shouting, weeping, seeing visions. The end was close. Lee's men set fire to the cotton and tobacco warehouses in Richmond, burned the arsenal, and fled from the city. At night while towering flames roared up into darkness, Grant was in hot pursuit. Banging away at the Confederates from both sides and the rear, while Sheridan's cavalry was heading them off in front, tearing up railway lines and capturing supply trains. Grant, half blind with a violent sick headache, fell behind his army and stopped at a farmhouse. I spent the night, he records in his memoirs, in bathing my feet in hot water and mustard, and putting mustard plasters on my wrists and the back part of my neck, hoping to be cured by morning. The next morning, he was cured instantaneously. And the tiling that cured him was not a mustard plaster, but a horseman galloping down the road with a letter from Lee, saying he wanted to surrender. When the officer bearing the message reached me, Grant wrote, I was still suffering with the sick headache, but the instant I saw the contents of the note, I was cured. Obviously it was Grant's worries, tensions, and emotions that made him ill. He was cured. Instantly the moment his emotions took on the hue of confidence, achievement, and victory. Seventy years later, Henry Morgan thought, Jr., Secretary of the Treasury in Franklin D. Roosevelt's cabinet, discovered that worry could make him so ill that he was dizzy. He records in his diary that he was terribly worried when the president, in order to raise the price of wheat, bought 4,400,000 bushels in one day. He says in his diary, I felt literally dizzy while the thing was going on. I went home and went to bed for two hours. After lunch. If I want to see what worry does to people, I don't have to go to a library or a physician. I can look out of the window of my home where I am writing this book, and I can see. Within one block, one house where worry caused a nervous breakdown and another. House where a man worried himself into diabetes. When the stock market went down. The sugar in his blood and urine went up. When Montaigne, the illustrious French philosopher, was elected mayor of his home. Town Bordeaux he said to his fellow citizens, I am willing to take your affairs into my hands but not into my liver and lungs. This neighbor of mine took the affairs of the stock market into the bloodstream and almost killed himself. Worry can put you into a wheelchair with rheumatism and arthritis. Dr. Russell L. Cecil of the Cornell University Medical School is a world-recognized authority on arthritis. And he has listed four of the commonest conditions that bring on arthritis. One marital shipwreck. Two financial disaster and grief. Three loneliness and worry. Four long-cherished resentments. Naturally, these four emotional situations are far from being the only causes of arthritis. There are many different kinds of arthritis due to various causes. But, to repeat, the commonest conditions that bring on arthritis are the four listed by Dr. Russell L. Cecil. For example, a friend of mine was so hard bit during the depression that the gas company shut off the gas and the bank foreclosed the mortgage on the house. His wife suddenly had a painful attack of arthritis and, in spite of medicine and diets, the arthritis continued until their financial situation improved. Worry can even cause tooth decay. Dr. William I. L. McGonagall said in an address before the American Dental Association that unpleasant emotions such as those caused by worry, fear, nagging, may upset the body's calcium balance and cause tooth decay. Dr. McGonagall told of a patient of his who had always had a perfect set of teeth until he 
began to worry over his wife's sudden illness. During the three weeks she was in the hospital, he developed nine cavities cavities brought on by worry. Have you ever seen a person with an acutely overactive thyroid? I have, and I can tell. You they tremble, they shake, they look like someone half scared to death and that's about what it amounts to. The thyroid gland, the gland that regulates the body, has been thrown out of kilter. It speeds up the heart the whole body is roaring away at full blast like a furnace with all its drafts wide open. And if this isn't checked, by operation or treatment, the victim may die, may burn himself out. A short time ago I went to Philadelphia with a friend of mine who has this disease. We went to see a famous specialist, a doctor who has been treating this type of ailment for 38 years. And what sort of advice do you suppose he had hanging on the wall of his waiting room painted on a large wooden sign so all his patients could see it? Hear it? Is. I copied it down on the back of an envelope while I was waiting. Relaxation and recreation. The most relaxing recreating forces are a healthy religion, sleep, music, and laughter. Have faith in God learn to sleep well love good music see the funny side of life and health and happiness will be yours. The first question he asked this friend of mine was, what emotional disturbance brought on this condition? He warned my friend that, if he didn't stop worrying, he could get other complications, heart trouble, stomach ulcers, or diabetes. All of these diseases, said that eminent doctor, are cousins, first cousins. Sure, they're first cousins they re all worry diseases. When I interviewed Merle Oberon, she told me that she refused to worry because she knew that worry would destroy her chief asset on the motion picture screen, her good looks. When I first tried to break into the movies, she told me, I was worried and scared. I had just come from India, and I didn't know anyone in London, where I was trying to get a job. I saw a few producers, but none of them hired me, and the little money I had began to give out. For two weeks I lived on nothing but crackers and water. I was not only worried now. I was hungry. I said to myself, maybe you're a fool. Maybe you will. Neuer break into the movies. After all, you have no experience, you've never acted at all what have you to offer but a rather pretty face. I went to the mirror. And when I looked in that mirror, I saw what worry was doing to my looks. I saw the lines it was forming. I saw the anxious expression. So I said to myself, you've got to stop this at once. You can't afford to worry. The only thing you have to offer at all is your looks, and worry will ruin them I Few things can age and sour a woman and destroy her looks as quickly as worry. Worry. Curdles the expression. It makes us clench our jaws and lines our faces with wrinkles. It. Forms a permanent scowl. It may turn the hair gray, and in some cases, even make it. Fall out. It can ruin the complexion it can bring on all kinds of skin rashes, eruptions. And pimples. Heart disease, is the number one killer in America today. During the Second World War, almost a third of a million men were killed in combat, but during that same period, heart disease killed two million civilians and one million of those casualties were caused by the kind of heart disease that is brought on by worry and high-tension living. Yes. Heart disease is one of the chief reasons why Dr. Alexis Carell said, businessmen who do not know how to fight worry die young. The Negroes down south and the Chinese rarely have the kind of heart disease brought on by worry, because they take things calmly. Twenty times as many doctors as farm workers die from heart failure. The doctors lead tense lives and pay the penalty. The Lord may forgive us our sins, said William James, but the nervous system never does. 
Here is a startling and almost incredible fact, more Americans commit suicide each year. Than die from the five most common communicable diseases. Why? The answer is largely, worry. When the cruel Chinese warlords wanted to torture their prisoners, they would tie their prisoners hand and foot and put them under a bag of water that constantly dripped. Dripped, dripped, day and night. These drops of water constantly falling on the head finally became like the sound of hammer blows and drove men insane. This same method of torture was used during the Spanish Inquisition and in German concentration. Camps under Hitler. Worry is like the constant drip, drip, drip of water, and the constant drip, drip, drip of worry often drives men to insanity and suicide. When I was a country lad in Missouri, I was half scared to death by listening to Billy. Sunday described the hell fires of the next world. But he never ever mentioned the hell fires of physical agony that worriers may have here and now. For example, if you are a chronic worrier, you may be stricken someday with one of the most excruciating pains ever endured by man, angina pectoris. Boy, if that ever hits you, you will scream with agony. Your screams will make the sounds in Dante's Inferno sound like babes in Toyland. You will say to yourself then, Oh, God, oh, God, if I can ever get over this, I will never worry about anything ever. If you think I am exaggerating, ask your family physician. Do you love life? Do you want to live long and enjoy good health? Here is how you can do it. I am quoting Dr. Alexis Carell again. He said, Those who keep the peace of their inner selves in the midst of the tumult of the modern city are immune from nervous diseases. Can you keep the peace of your inner self in the midst of the tumult of a modem city? If you are a normal person, the answer is yes. Emphatically yes. Most of us are stronger than we realize. We have inner resources that we have probably never tapped. As Thoreau said in his immortal book, Walden. I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man to elevate his life by a conscious endeavor. If one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams, and endeavors to live the life he has imagined, he will meet with a success. Unexpected in common hours. Surely, many of the readers of this book have as much willpower and as many inner resources as Olga K. Yarve has. Her address is Box 892, Kerr Delane, Idaho. She discovered that under the most tragic circumstances she could banish worry. I firmly believe that you and I can also if we apply the old, old truths discussed in this volume. Here is Olga K. Yarve's story as she wrote it for me, eight and a half years ago, I was condemned to die a slow, agonizing death of cancer. The best medical brains of the country, the Mayo brothers, confirmed the sentence. I was at a dead-end street, the ultimate gaped at me. I was young. I did not want to die. In my desperation, I phoned to my doctor at Kellogg and cried out to him the despair in my heart. Rather impatiently. He upbraided me, what's the matter, Olga, haven't you any fight in you? Sure, you will. Die if you keep on crying. Yes, the worst has overtaken you. O.K. Face the facts. Quit. Worrying one and then do something about it? Right then and there I took an oath, an oath. So solemn that the nails sank deep into my flesh and cold chills ran down my spine, I am not going to worry. I am not going to cry. And if there is anything to mind over matter, I am going to win. I am going to live. The usual amount of X-ray in such advanced cases, where they cannot apply radium, is ten and a half minutes a day for thirty days. They gave me X-ray for fourteen and a half minutes a day for forty-nine days, and although my bones stuck out of my emaciated body like rocks on a barren 
hillside, and although my feet were like lead, I did not worry. Not once did I cry. I smiled. Yes, I actually forced myself to smile. I am not so foolish as to imagine that merely smiling can cure cancer. But I do believe that a cheerful mental attitude helps the body fight disease. At any rate, I experienced one of the miracle cures of cancer. I have never been healthier than in the last few years, thanks to those challenging, fighting words of Dr. McCaffrey, face the facts. Quite worrying, then do something about it. I am going to close this chapter by repeating its title, the words of Dr. Alexis Carell. Businessmen who do not know how to fight worry die young. The fanatical followers of the Prophet Muhammad often had verses from the Quran tattooed on their breasts. I would like to have the title of this chapter tattooed on the breast of every reader of this book, Businessmen Who Do Not Know How to Fight Worry. Die Young. Was Dr. Carell speaking of you? Could be. Part 1 in a nutshell. Rule 1, if you want to avoid worry, do what Sir William Osher did live in daytight compartments. Don't stew about the future. Just live each day until bedtime. Rule 2, the next time trouble with a capital T comes gunning for you and backs you up. In a corner, try the magic formula of Willis H. Carrier. A. Ask yourself, what is the worst that can possibly happen if I can't solve my problem? B. Prepare yourself mentally to accept the worst if necessary. See then calmly try to improve upon the worst which you have already mentally agreed to accept. Rule 3, remind yourself of the exorbitant price you can pay for worry in terms of your health. Businessmen who do not know how to fight worry die young. Part 2, Basic Techniques in Analyzing Worry. Chapter 4, How to Analyze and Solve Worry Problems. I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when. And how and where and who. Rudyard Kipling. Will the magic formula of Willis H. Carrier, described in Part 1, Chapter 2, solve all worry problems? No, of course not. Then what is the answer? The answer is that we must equip ourselves to deal with different kinds of worries by learning the three basic steps of problem analysis. The three steps are 1. Get the facts. 2. Analyze the facts. 3. Arrive at a decision and then act on that decision. Obvious stuff? Yes, Aristotle taught it and used it. And you and I must use it too if we are going to solve the problems that are harassing us and turning our days and nights into veritable hells. Let's take the first rule, get the facts. Why is it so important to get the facts? Because, unless we have the facts we can't possibly even attempt to solve our problem intelligently. Without the facts, all we can do is stew around in confusion. My idea? No. That was the idea of the late Herbert E. Hawks, Dean of Columbia College, Columbia University, for 22 years. He had helped 200,000 students solve their worry problems, and he told me that confusion is the chief cause of worry. He put it this way he said, half the worry in the world is caused by people trying to make decisions before they have sufficient knowledge on which to base a decision. For example, he said, if I have a problem which has to be faced at 3 o'clock next Tuesday, I refuse even to try to make a decision about it until next Tuesday arrives. In the meantime, I concentrate on getting all the facts that bear on the problem. I don't worry, he said, I don't agonize over my problem. I don't lose any sleep. I simply Concentrate on getting the facts. And by the time Tuesday rolls around, if I've got all the facts, the problem usually solves itself. I asked Dean Hawks if this meant he had licked worry entirely. Yes, he said, I think I 
can honestly say that my life is now almost totally devoid of worry. I have found, he went on, that if a man will devote his time to securing facts in an impartial, objective way, his worries usually evaporate in the light of knowledge. Let me repeat that, if a man will devote his time to securing facts in an impartial, objective way, his worries will usually evaporate in the light of knowledge. But what do most of us do? If we bother with facts at all and Thomas Edison said in all seriousness, there is no expedient to which a man will not resort to avoid the labor of thinking if we bother with facts at all, we hunt like bird dogs after the facts that bolster up what we already think and ignore all the others. We want only the facts that justify our acts the facts that fit inconveniently with our wishful thinking and justify our preconceived prejudices. As Andre Moro has put it, everything that is in agreement with our personal desires seems true. Everything that is not puts us into a rage. Is it any wonder, then, that we find it so hard to get at the answers to our problems? Wouldn't we have the same trouble trying to solve a second grade arithmetic problem, if we went ahead on the assumption that 2 plus 2 equals 5? Yet there are a lot of people in this world who make life a hell for themselves and others by insisting that 2 plus 2 equals 5 or maybe 500. What can we do about it? We have to keep our emotions out of our thinking, and, as Dean Hawkes put it, we must secure the facts in an impartial, objective manner. That is not an easy task when we are worried. When we are worried, our emotions are riding high. But here are two ideas that I have found helpful when trying to step aside from my problems, in order to see the facts in a clear, objective manner. One when trying to get the facts, I pretend that I am collecting this information not for myself, but for some other person. This helps me to take a cold, impartial view of the evidence. This helps me eliminate my emotions. Two while trying to collect the facts about the problem that is worrying me, I sometimes pretend that I am a lawyer preparing to argue the other side of the issue. In other words, I try to get all the facts against myself all the facts that are damaging to my wishes, all the facts I don't like to face. Then I write down both my side of the case and the other side of the case and I generally find that the truth lies somewhere in between these two extremities. Here is the point I am trying to make. Neither you nor I nor Einstein nor the Supreme Court of the United States is brilliant enough to reach an intelligent decision on any problem without first getting the facts. Thomas Edison knew that. At the time of his death, he had 2,500 notebooks filled with facts about the problems he was facing. So rule one for solving our problems is, get the facts. Let's do what Dean Hawkes did, let's not even attempt to solve our problems without first collecting all the facts in an impartial manner. However, getting all the facts in the world won't do us any good until we analyze them and interpret them. I have found from costly experience that it is much easier to analyze the facts after writing them so. In fact, merely writing the facts on a piece of paper and stating our problem clearly goes a long way toward helping us to reach a sensible decision. As Charles Kettering puts it, a problem well stated is a problem half solved. Let me show you all this as it works out in practice. Since the Chinese say one picture is worth 10,000 words, Suppose I show you a picture of how one man put exactly what we are talking about into concrete action. Let's take the case of Galen Litchfield a man I have known for several years, one of the most successful American businessmen in the Far East. Mr. Litchfield was in China in 1942, when the Japanese invaded Shanghai. And here is his story as he told it to me. While a guest in my home. Shortly after the Japs took Pearl Harbor, Galen Litchfield began, they came swarming into Shanghai. 
I was the manager of the Asia Life Insurance Company in Shanghai. They sent us an army liquidator he was really an admiral and gave me orders to assist this man in liquidating our assets. I didn't have any choice in the matter. I could cooperate or else. And that or else was certain death. I went through the motions of doing what I was told, because I had no alternative. But there was one block of securities, worth $750,000, which I left off the list I gave to the Admiral. I left that block of securities off the list because they belonged to our Hong Kong organization and had nothing to do with the Shanghai assets. All the same, I feared. I might be in hot water if the Japs found out what I had done. And they soon found out. I wasn't in the office when the discovery was made, but my head accountant was there. He told me that the Jap admiral flew into a rage, and stamped and swore, and called me a thief and a traitor. I had defied the Japanese army. I knew what that meant. I would be thrown into the bridge house. The bridge house won the torture chamber of the Japanese Gestapo. I had had personal friends who had killed themselves rather than be taken to that prison. I had had other friends who had died in that place after ten days of questioning and torture. Now I was slated for the bridge house myself. What did I do? I heard the news on Sunday afternoon. I suppose I should have been terrified. And I would have been terrified if I hadn't had a definite technique for solving my problems. For years, whenever I was worried I had always gone to my typewriter and written down two questions and the answers to these questions. 1. What am I worrying about? 2. What can I do about it? I used to try to answer those questions without writing them down. But I stopped that. Years ago. I found that writing down both the questions and the answers clarifies my thinking. So, that Sunday afternoon, I went directly to my room at the Shanghai YMCA and got out my typewriter. I wrote, I. What am I worrying about? I am afraid I will be thrown into the bridge house tomorrow morning. Then I typed out the second question. 2. What can I do about it? I spent hours thinking out and writing down the four courses of action I could take and what the probable consequence of each action would be. One I can try to explain to the Japanese admiral. But he no speak English. If I try to explain to him through an interpreter, I may stir him up again. That might mean death. For he is cruel, would rather dump me in the bridge house than bother talking about it. Two I can try to escape. Impossible. They keep track of me all the time. I have to check in. And out of my room at the YMCA. If I try to escape, I'll probably be captured and shot. 3. I can stay here in my room and not go near the office again. If I do, the Japanese admiral will be suspicion, will probably send soldiers to get me and throw me into the bridge house without giving me a chance to say a word. 4. I can go down to the office as usual on Monday morning. If I do, there is a chance that the Japanese admiral may be so busy that he will not think of what I did. Even if he does think of it, he may have cooled off and may not bother me. If this happens, I am all right. Even if he does bother me, I'll still have a chance to try to explain to him. So, going down to the office as usual on Monday morning, and acting as if nothing had gone. Wrong gives me two chances to escape the bridge house. As soon as I thought it all out and decided to accept the fourth plan to go down to the office as usual on Monday morning I felt immensely relieved. When I entered the office the next morning, the Japanese admiral sat there with a cigarette dangling from his mouth. He glared at me as he always did, and said nothing. Six weeks later thank God he went back to Tokyo and my worries were ended. As I have already said, I probably saved my life by sitting down that Sunday afternoon. 
and writing out all the various steps I could take and then writing down the probable consequences of each step and calmly coming to a decision. If I hadn't done that, I might have floundered and hesitated and done the wrong thing on the spur of the moment. If I hadn't thought out my problem and come to a decision, I would have been frantic with worry all Sunday afternoon. I wouldn't have slept that night. I would have gone down to the office Monday morning with a harassed and worried look, and that alone might have aroused the suspicion of the Japanese admiral and spurred him to act. Experience has proved to me, time after time, the enormous value of arriving at a decision. It is the failure to arrive at a fixed purpose, the inability to stop going round and round in maddening circles, that drives men to nervous breakdowns and living hells. I find that 50% of my worries vanishes once I arrive at a clear, definite decision, and another 40% usually vanishes once I start to carry out that decision. So I banish about 90% of my worries by taking these four steps. 1. Writing down precisely what I am worrying about. 2. Writing down what I can do about it. 3. Deciding what to do. 4. Starting immediately to carry out that decision. Galen Litchfield is now the Far Eastern Director for Star, Park and Freeman Incorporated. 3. John Street, New York, representing large insurance and financial interests. In fact, as I said before, Galen Litchfield today is one of the most important American businessmen in Asia, and he confesses to me that he owes a large part of his success to this method of analyzing worry and meeting it head on. Why is his method so superb? Because it is efficient, concrete, and goes directly to the heart of the problem. On top of all that, it is climaxed by the third and indispensable rule, do something about it. Unless we carry out our action, all our fact-finding and analysis is whistling upwind it's a sheer waste of energy. William James said this, when once a decision is reached and execution is the order of the day, dismiss absolutely all responsibility and care about the outcome. In this case, William James undoubtedly used the word care as a synonym for anxiety. He meant once you have made a careful decision based on facts, go into action. Don't stop to reconsider. Don't begin to hesitate worry and retrace your steps. Don't lose yourself in self-doubting which begets other doubts. Don't keep looking back over your shoulder. I once asked Wade Phillips, one of Oklahoma's most prominent oil men, how he carried out decisions. He replied, I find that to keep thinking about our problems beyond a certain point is bound to create confusion and worry. There comes a time when any more investigation and thinking are harmful. There comes a time when we must decide and act and never look back. Why don't you employ Galen Litchfield's technique to one of your worries right now? Here is question number one What am I worrying about? Please pencil the answer to that question in the space below. Question number two What can I do about it? Please write your answer to that question in the space below. Question number three here is what I am going to do about it. Question number four when am I going to start doing it? Chapter 5, How to Eliminate 50% of Tour Business Worries If you are a businessman, you are probably saying to yourself right now, the title of this chapter is ridiculous. I have been running my business for 19 years, and I certainly know the answers if anybody does. The idea of anybody trying to tell me how I can eliminate 50% of my business worries it's absurd I. Fair enough I would have felt exactly the same way myself a few years ago if I had seen this title on a chapter. It promises a lot and promises are cheap. Let's be very frank about it, maybe I won't be able to help you eliminate 50% of your business worries. In the last analysis, no one can do that, except yourself. But, 
What I can do is to show you how other people have done it and leave the rest to you. You may recall that on page 25 of this book I quoted the world-famous Dr. Alexis Carell. As saying, businessmen who do not know how to fight worry die young. Since worry is that serious, wouldn't you be satisfied if I could help you eliminate even 10% of your worries? Yes. Good. Well, I am going to show you how one. Business executive eliminated not 50% of his worries, but 75%. Of all the time he formerly spent in conferences, trying to solve business problems. Furthermore, I am not going to tell you the story about a Mr. Jones or a Mr. X or, or a man I know in Ohio vague stories that you can't check up on. It concerns a very real Person Leon Shimkin, a partner and general manager of one of the foremost publishing houses in the United States, Simon and Schuster, Rockefeller Center, New York 20, New York. Here is Leon Shimkin's experience in his own words. For 15 years I spent almost half of every business day holding conferences. Discussing problems. Should we do this or that do nothing at all? We would get tense. Twist in our chairs, walk the floor, argue and go around in circles. When night came, I would be utterly exhausted. I fully expected to go on doing this sort of thing for the rest of my life. I had been doing it for 15 years, and it never occurred to me that there was a better way of doing it. If anyone had told me that I could eliminate three-fourths of all the time I spent in those worried conferences, and three-fourths of my nervous strain I would have thought he was a wild-eyed, slap-happy, armchair optimist. Yet I devised a plan that did just that. I have been using this plan for eight years. It has performed wonders for my efficiency, my health, and my happiness. It sounds like magic but like all magic tricks, it is extremely simple when you see how it is done. Here is the secret, first, I immediately stopped the procedure I had been using in my conferences for 15 years a procedure that began with my troubled associates. Reciting all the details of what had gone wrong, and ending up by asking, what shall we do? Second, I made a new rule a rule that everyone who wishes to present a problem to me must first prepare and submit a memorandum answering these four questions. Question 1, what is the problem? In the old days we used to spend an hour or two in a worried conference without anyone's knowing specifically and concretely what the real problem was. We used to work ourselves into a lather discussing our troubles without ever troubling to write out specifically what our problem was. Question 2. What is the cause of the problem? As I look back over my career, I am appalled at the wasted hours I have spent in worried conferences without ever trying to find out clearly the conditions which lay at the root of the problem. Question 3. What are all possible solutions of the problem? In the old days, one man in the conference would suggest one solution. Someone else would argue with him. Tempers would flare we would often get clear off the subject. And at the end of the conference no one would have written down all the various things we could do to attack the problem. Question 4, what solution do you suggest? I used to go into a conference with a man who had spent hours worrying about a situation and going around in circles without ever once thinking through all possible solutions and then writing down, this is the solution I recommend. My associates rarely come to me now with their problems. Why? Because they have discovered that in order to answer these four questions they have to get all the facts and think their problems through. And after they have done that they find, in three-fourths of the cases, they don't have to consult me at all, because the proper solution has popped out like a piece of bread popping out from an electric toaster. Even in those Cases where consultation is necessary, the discussion takes about one-third the time. Formerly required, because it proceeds along an orderly, 
logical path to a reasoned conclusion. Much less time is now consumed in the house of Simon and Schuster in worrying and talking about what is wrong, and a lot more action is obtained toward making those things right. My friend, Frank Becker, one of the top insurance men in America, tells me he not only reduced his business worries, but nearly doubled his income, by a similar method. Years ago, says Frank Becker, when I first started to sell insurance, I was filled with a boundless enthusiasm and love for my work. Then something happened. I became so discouraged that I despised my work and thought of giving it up. I think I would have quit if I hadn't got the idea, one Saturday morning, of sitting down and trying to get at the root of my worries. 1. I asked myself first, just what is the problem, dot. The problem was, that I was not getting high enough returns for the staggering amount of calls I was making. I seemed to do pretty well at selling a prospect, until the moment came for closing a sale. Then the customer would say, well, I'll think it over, Mr. Becker. Come and see me again. It was the time I wasted on these follow-up calls that was causing my depression. 2. I asked myself, what are the possible solutions? But to get the answer to that one, I had to study the facts. I got out my record book for the last 12 months and studied the figures. I made an astounding discovery. Right there in black and white, I discovered that 70% of my sales had been closed on the very first interview. 23 percent of my sales had been closed on the second interview. And only 7% of my sales had been closed on those third, fourth, fifth, etc. interviews, which were running me ragged and taking up my time. In other words, I was wasting fully one half of my working day on a part of my business which was responsible for only 7% of my sales. 3. What is the answer? The answer was obvious. I immediately cut out all visits beyond the second interview, and spent the extra time building up new prospects. The results were unbelievable. In a very short time, I had almost doubled the cash value of every visit I made from a call. As I said, Frank Becker is now one of the best-known life insurance salesmen in America. He is with Fidelity Mutual of Philadelphia, and writes a million dollars worth of policies a year. But he was on the point of giving up. He was on the point of admitting failure until analyzing the problem gave him a boost on the road to success. Can you apply these questions to your business problems? To repeat my challenge they can reduce your worries by 50%. Here they are again. 1. What is the problem? 2. What is the cause of the problem? 3. What are all possible solutions to the problem? 4. What solution do you suggest? Part 2 in a nutshell. Rule 1. Get the facts. Remember that Dean Hawks of Columbia University said that half the worry in the world is caused by people trying to make decisions before they have sufficient knowledge on which to base a decision. Rule 2. After carefully weighing all the facts, come to a decision. Rule 3, once a decision is carefully reached, act. Get busy carrying out your decision and dismiss all anxiety about the outcome. Rule 4, when you, or any of your associates are tempted to worry about a problem, write out and answer the following questions. A. What is the problem? B. What is the cause of the problem? C. What are all possible solutions? D. What is the best solution? 9. Suggestions on how to get the most out of this book. 1. If you wish to get the most out of this book, there is one indispensable requirement. 1. Essential infinitely more important than any rules or technique. Unless you have this. 1. Fundamental requisite a thousand rules on how to study will avail little. And if you. Do have this cardinal endowment, 
then you can achieve wonders without reading any. Suggestions for getting the most out of a book. What is this magic requirement? Just this, a deep, driving desire to learn, a vigorous determination to stop worrying and start living. How can you develop such an urge? By constantly reminding yourself of how important these principles are to you. Picture to yourself how their mastery will aid you in living a richer, happier life. Say to yourself over and over, my peace of mind, my happiness, my health, and perhaps even my income will, in the long run, depend largely on applying the old, obvious, and eternal truths taught in this book. To read each chapter rapidly at first to get a bird's eye view of it. You will probably be tempted then to rush on to the next one. But don't. Unless you are reading merely for entertainment. But if you are reading because you want to stop worrying and start living, then go back and reread each chapter thoroughly. In the long run, this will mean saving time and getting results. 3. Stop frequently in your reading to think over what you are reading. Ask yourself just how and when you can apply each suggestion. That kind of reading will aid you far more than racing ahead like a whippet chasing a rabbit. For read with a red crayon, pencil, or fountain pen in your hand, and when you come across a suggestion that you feel you can use, draw a line beside it. If it is a four-star suggestion, then underscore every sentence, or mark it with XXXX. Marking and underscoring a book make it more interesting, and far easier to review rapidly. 5. I know a man who has been office manager for a large insurance concern for 15 years. He reads every month all the insurance contracts his company issues. Yes, he reads the same contracts over month after month, year after year. Why? Because experience has taught him that that is the only way he can keep their provisions clearly in mind. I once spent almost two years writing a book on public speaking, and yet I find I have to keep going back over it from time to time in order to remember what I wrote in my own book. The rapidity with which we forget is astonishing. So, if you want to get a real, lasting benefit out of this book, don't imagine that skimming through it once will suffice. After reading it thoroughly, you ought to spend a few hours reviewing it every month. Keep it on your desk in front of you every day. Glance through it often. Keep constantly impressing yourself with the rich possibilities for improvement that still lie in the offing. Remember that the use of these principles can be made habitual and unconscious only by a constant and vigorous campaign of review and application. There is no other way. 6. Bernard Shaw once remarked, if you teach a man anything, he will never learn. Shaw was right. Learning is an active process. We learn by doing. So, if you desire to master the principles you are studying in this book, do something about them. Apply these rules at every opportunity. If you don't you will forget them quickly. Only knowledge that is used sticks in your mind. You will probably find it difficult to apply these suggestions all the time. I know. Because I wrote this book, and yet frequently I find it difficult to apply everything I have advocated here. So, as you read this book, remember that you are not merely trying to acquire information. You are attempting to form new habits. Ah yes, you are attempting a new way of life. That will require time and persistence and daily application. So refer to these pages often. Regard this as a working handbook on conquering worry. And when you are confronted with some trying problem don't get all stirred up. Don't do the natural thing, the impulsive thing. That is usually wrong. Instead, turn to these pages and review the paragraphs you have underscored. Then try these new ways and watch them achieve magic for you.
7. Offer your wife a shilling every time she catches you violating one of the principles advocated in this book. She will break you. 8. Please turn to pages 193 to 4 of this book and read how the Wall Street banker, H.P. Howell, and old Ben Franklin corrected their mistakes. Why don't you use the Howell and Franklin techniques to check up on your application of the principles discussed in this book? If you do, two things will result. First, you will find yourself engaged in an educational process that is both intriguing and priceless. Second, you will find that your ability to stop worrying and start living will grow and spread like a green bay tree. 9. Keep a diary A diary in which you ought to record your triumphs in the application of these principles. Be specific. Give names dates, results. Keeping such a record will inspire you to greater efforts, and how fascinating these entries will be when you chance upon them some evening, years from now. In a nutshell, 1. Develop a deep, driving desire to master the principles of conquering worry. 2. Read each chapter twice before going on to the next one. 3. As you read, Stop frequently to ask yourself how you can apply each suggestion. 4. Underscore each important idea. 5. Review this book each month. 6. Apply these principles at every opportunity. Use this volume as a working handbook. To help you solve your daily problems. 7. Make a lively game put of your learning by offering some friend a shilling every time. He catches you violating one of these principles. 8. Check up each week on the progress you are making. Ask yourself what mistakes you have made, what improvement, what lessons you have learned for the future. 9. Keep a diary in the back of this book showing how and when you have applied these principles. Part 3, How to Break the Worry Habit Before It Breaks You. Chapter 6, How to Crowd Worry Out of Tour Mind. I shall never forget the night, a few years ago, when Marion J. Douglas was a student in one of my classes. I have not used his real name. He requested me, for personal reasons, not to reveal his identity. But here is his real story as he told it before one of our adult education classes. He told us how tragedy had struck at his home, not once, but twice. The first time he had lost his five year old daughter, a child he adored. He and his wife thought they couldn't endure that first loss, but, as he said, ten months later, God gave us another little girl and she died in five days. This double bereavement was almost too much to bear. I couldn't take it, this father told us. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat, I couldn't rest or relax. My nerves were utterly shaken and my confidence gone. At last he went to doctors, one recommended sleeping pills and another recommended a trip. He tried both, but neither remedy helped. He said, my body felt as if it were encased in a vice, and the jaws of the vice were being drawn tighter and tighter. The tension of grief if you have ever been paralyzed by sorrow, you know what he meant. But thank God, I had one child left a four-year-old son. He gave me the solution to my problem. One afternoon as I sat around feeling sorry for myself, he asked, Daddy, will you build a boat for me? I was in no mood to build a boat, in fact, I was in no mood to do anything. But my son is a persistent little fellow. I had to give in. Building that toy boat took about three hours. By the time it was finished, I realized that those three hours spent building that boat were the first hours of mental relaxation and peace that I had had in months. That discovery jarred me out of my lethargy and caused me to do a bit of thinking the first real thinking I had done in months. I realized that it is difficult to worry while you are busy doing something that requires planning and thinking. In my case, building the boat had knocked worry out of the ring. 
so I resolved to keep busy. The following night, I went from room to room in the house, compiling a list of jobs. That ought to be done. Scores of items needed to be repaired, bookcases, stair steps, storm windows, window shades, knobs, locks, leaky taps. Astonishing as it seems, in the course of two weeks I had made a list of 242 items that needed attention. During the last two years I have completed most of them. Besides, I have filled my life with stimulating activities. Two nights per week I attend adult education classes in New York. I have gone in for civic activities in my hometown and I am now chairman of the school board. I attend scores of meetings. I help collect money for the Red Cross and no time for worry. That is exactly what Winston Churchill said when he was working 18 hours a day at the height of the war. When he was asked if he worried about his tremendous responsibilities, he said, I'm too busy. I have no time for worry. Charles Kettering was in that same fix when he started out to invent a self-starter for automobiles. Mr. Kettering was, until his recent retirement, vice president of General Motors in charge of the world-famous General Motors Research Corporation. But in those days, he was so poor that he had to use the hayloft of a barn as a laboratory to buy groceries, he had to use $1,500 that his wife had made by giving piano lessons, later, had to borrow $500 on his life insurance. I asked his wife if she wasn't worried at a time like that. Yes, she replied, I was so worried I couldn't sleep, but Mr. Kettering wasn't. He was too absorbed in his work to worry. The great scientist, Pasteur, spoke of the peace that is found in libraries and laboratories. Why is peace found there? Because the men in libraries and laboratories are usually too absorbed in their tasks to worry about themselves. Research men rarely have nervous breakdowns. They haven't time for such luxuries. Why does such a simple thing as keeping busy help to drive out anxiety? Because of a law one of the most fundamental laws ever revealed by psychology. And that law is that it is utterly impossible for any human mind, no matter how brilliant, to think of more than one thing at any given time. You don't quite believe it? Very well, then, let's try an experiment. Suppose you lean right back now, close your eyes, and try, at the same instant, to think of the Statue of Liberty and of what you plan to do tomorrow morning. Go ahead, try it. You found out, didn't you, that you could focus on either thought in turn, but never on both simultaneously? Well, the same thing is true in the field of emotions. We cannot be peppied up and enthusiastic about doing something exciting and feel dragged down by worry at the very same time. One kind of emotion drives out the other. And it was that simple discovery that enabled army psychiatrists to perform such miracles during the war. When men came out of battle so shaken by the experience that they were called psychoneurotic, army doctors prescribed keep em busy as a cure. Every waking minute of these nerve-shocked men was filled with activity usually. Outdoor activity, such as fishing, hunting, playing ball, golf, taking pictures, making gardens, and dancing. They were given no time for brooding over their terrible experiences. Occupational therapy is the term now used by psychiatry when work is prescribed as though it were a medicine. It is not new. The old Greek physicians were advocating it. 500 years before Christ was born, the Quakers were using it in Philadelphia in Ben Franklin's time. A man who visited a Quaker sanatorium in 1774 was shocked to see that the patients who were mentally ill were busy spinning flax. He thought these poor unfortunates were being exploited until 
the Quakers explained that they found that their patients actually improved when they did a little work. It was soothing to the nerves. Any psychiatrist will tell you that work keeping busy is one of the best anesthetics ever. Known for sick nerves. Henry W. Longfellow found that out for himself when he lost his young wife. His wife had been melting some sealing wax at a candle one day, when her clothes caught on fire. Longfellow heard her cries and tried to reach her in time, but she died from the burns. For a while, Longfellow was so tortured by the memory of that dreadful experience that he nearly went insane, but, fortunately for him, his three small children needed his attention. In spite of his own grief, Longfellow undertook to be father and mother to his children. He took them for walks, told them stories, played games with them, and immortalized their companionship in his poem The Children's Hour. He also translated Dante, and all these duties combined kept him so busy that he forgot himself entirely, and regained his peace of mind. As Tennyson declared when he lost his most intimate friend, Arthur Hallam, I must lose myself in action, lest I wither. In despair. Most of us have little trouble losing ourselves in action while we have our noses to the grindstone and are doing our day's work. But the hours after work they are the dangerous ones. Just when we're free to enjoy our own leisure, and ought to be happiest that's when the blue devils of worry attack us. That's when we begin to wonder whether we're getting anywhere in life, whether we're in a rut, whether the boss meant anything by that remark he made today, or whether we're getting bald. When we are not busy, our minds tend to become a near vacuum. Every student of physics knows that nature abhors a vacuum. The nearest thing to a vacuum that you and I will probably ever see is the inside of an incandescent electric light bulb. Break. That bulb and nature forces air in to fill the theoretically empty space. Nature also rushes in to fill the vacant mind. With what? Usually with emotions. Why? Because emotions of worry, fear, hate, jealousy, and envy are driven by primeval vigor. And the dynamic energy of the jungle. Such emotions are so violent that they tend to drive out of our minds all peaceful, nappy thoughts and emotions. James L. Mercell, professor of education, Teachers College, Columbia, puts it very well. When he says, worry is most apt to ride you ragged not when you are in action, but when the day's work is done. Your imagination can run riot then and bring up all sorts of ridiculous possibilities and magnify each little blunder. At such a time, he continues, your mind is like a motor operating without its load. It races and threatens to burn out its bearings or even to tear itself to bits. The remedy for worry is to get completely occupied doing something constructive. But you don't have to be a college professor to realize this truth and put it into practice. During the war, I met a housewife from Chicago who told me how she discovered for herself that the remedy for worry is to get completely occupied doing something constructive. I met this woman and her husband in the dining car while I was traveling from New York to my farm in Missouri. Sorry I didn't get their names I never like to give. Examples without using names and street addresses details that give authenticity to a story. This couple told me that their son had joined the armed forces the day after Pearl Harbor. The woman told me that she had almost wrecked her health worrying over that only son. Where was he? Was he safe? Or in action? Would he be wounded? Killed? When I asked her how she overcame her worry, she replied, I got busy. She told me. That at first she had dismissed her maid and tried to keep busy by doing all her housework herself. But that didn't help much. The trouble was, she said, that I could do my housework almost mechanically, without using my mind. 
so I kept on worrying. While making the beds and washing the dishes I realized I needed some new kind of work that would keep me busy both mentally and physically every hour of the day. So I. That did it, she said. I immediately found myself in a whirlwind of activity, customers. Swarming around me, asking for prices, sizes, colors. Never a second to think of. Anything except my immediate duty, and when night came, I could think of nothing. Except getting off my aching feet. As soon as I ate dinner, I fell into bed and instantly. Became unconscious. I had neither the time nor the energy to worry. She discovered for herself what John Cooper Powis meant when he said, in the art of. Forgetting the unpleasant, a certain comfortable security, a certain profound inner. Peace, a kind of happy numbness, soothes the nerves of the human animal when absorbed in its allotted task. And what a blessing that it is so. O.S.A. Johnson, the world's most famous woman explorer, recently told me how she found release from worry and grief. You may have read the story of her life. It is called I Married Adventure. If any woman ever married adventure, she certainly did. Martin Johnson married her when she was 16 and lifted her feet off the sidewalks of Chanute, Kansas and set them down on the wild jungle trails of Borneo. For a quarter of a century, this Kansas couple traveled all over the world, making motion pictures of the vanishing wildlife of Asia and Africa. Back in America, nine years ago, they were on a lecture tour, showing their famous films. They took a plane out of Denver, bound for the coast. The plane plunged into a mountain. Martin Johnson was killed instantly. The doctors said OSA would never leave her bed again. But they didn't know OSA Johnson. Three months later, she was in a wheelchair, lecturing before large audiences. In fact, she addressed over a hundred audiences that season all from a wheelchair. When I asked her why she did it, she replied, I did it so that I would have no time for sorrow and worry. O.S.A. Johnson had discovered the same truth that Tennyson had sung about a century. Earlier, I must lose myself in action, lest I wither in despair. Admiral Byrd discovered this same truth when he lived all alone for five months in a shack that was literally buried in the great glacial ice cap that covers the South Pole and ice cap that holds nature's oldest secrets an ice cap covering an unknown continent larger than the United States and Europe combined. Admiral Byrd spent five months there alone. No other living creature of any kind existed within a hundred miles. The cold was so intense that he could hear his breath freeze and crystal Lisa as the wind blew. It passed his ears. In his book alone, Admiral Byrd tells all about those five months he spent in bewildering and soul-shattering darkness. The days were as black as the nights. He had to keep busy to preserve his sanity. At night, he says, before blowing out the lantern, I formed the habit of blocking out the morrow's work. It was a case of assigning myself an hour, say, to the escape tunnel. Half an hour to leveling drift, an hour to straightening up the fuel drums, an hour to cutting bookshelves in the walls of the food tunnel, and two hours to renewing a broken bridge in the men hauling sledge. It was wonderful, he says, to be able to dole out time in this way. It brought me an extraordinary sense of command over myself. And he adds, without that or an equivalent, the days would have been without purpose, and without purpose they would have ended, as such days always end, in disintegration. Note that last again, without purpose, the days would have ended, as such days always end, in disintegration. If you and I are worried, let's remember that we can use good old-fashioned work as a medicine. That was said by no less an authority than the late Dr. Richard C. Cabot formerly professor of clinical medicine at Harvard. In his book What Men Live By, D.R. 
Cabot says, as a physician, I have had the happiness of seeing work cure many persons who have suffered from trembling palsy of the soul which results from overmastering doubts, hesitations, vacillation, and fear. Courage given us by our work is like the self-reliance which Emerson has made forever glorious. If you and I don't keep busy if we sit around and brood we will hatch out a whole flock of what Charles Darwin used to call the Wibber Gibbers. And the Wibber Gibbers are nothing but old-fashioned gremlins that will run us hollow and destroy our power of action and our power of will. I know a businessman in New York who fought the Wibber Gibbers by getting so busy that he had no time to fret and stew. His name is Tremper Longman, and his office is at 40 Wall Street. He was a student in one of my adult education classes, and his talk on conquering worry was so interesting, so impressive, that I asked him to have supper with me after class, and we sat in a restaurant until long past midnight, discussing his experiences. Here is the story he told me, 18 years ago, I was so worried I had insomnia. I was tense, irritated, and jittery. I felt I was headed for a nervous breakdown. I had reason to be worried. I was treasurer of the Crown Fruit and Extract Company. 418 West Broadway, New York. We had half a million dollars invested in strawberries. Packed in gallon tins. For 20 years, we had been selling these gallon tins of strawberries to manufacturers of ice cream. Suddenly our sales stopped because the big ice cream makers, such as National Dairy and Borden's, were rapidly increasing their production and were saving money and time by buying strawberries packed in barrels. Not only were we left with half a million dollars in berries we couldn't sell, but we were also under contract to buy a million dollars more of strawberries in the next 12 months. We had already borrowed $350,000 from the banks. We couldn't possibly pay off or renew these loans. No wonder I was worried. I rushed out to Watsonville, California, where our factory was located, and tried to persuade our president that conditions had changed, that we were facing ruin. He refused to believe it. He blamed our New York office for all the trouble poor salesmanship. After days of pleading, I finally persuaded him to stop packing more strawberries and to sell our new supply on the fresh berry market in San Francisco. That almost solved our problems. I should have been able to stop worrying then, but I couldn't. Worry is a habit and I had that habit. When I returned to New York, I began worrying about everything, the cherries we were buying in Italy, the pineapples we were buying in Hawaii, and so on. I was tense, jittery, couldn't sleep, and, as I have already said, I was heading for a nervous breakdown. In despair, I adopted a way of life that cured my insomnia and stopped my worries. I got busy. I got so busy with problems demanding all my faculties that I had no time to worry. I had been working 7 hours a day. I now began working 15 and 16 hours a day. I got down to the office every morning at 8 o'clock and stayed there. Every night until almost midnight. I took on new duties, new responsibilities. When I got home at midnight, I was so exhausted when I fell in bed that I became unconscious in a few seconds. I kept up this program for about three months. I had broken the habit of worry by that time, so I returned to a normal working day of seven or eight hours. This event occurred 18 years ago. I have never been troubled with insomnia or worry since then. George Bernard Shaw was right. He summed it all up when he said, the secret of being miserable is to have the leisure to bother about whether you are happy or not. So don't bother to think about it. Spit on your hands and get busy. Your blood will start 
circulating, your mind will start ticking and pretty soon this whole positive upsurge of life in your body will drive worry from your mind. Get busy. Keep busy. It's the cheapest kind of medicine there is on this earth and one of the best. To break the worry habit, here is rule one. Keep busy. The worried person must lose himself in action, lest be wither in despair.